So just so you know, in the next 15 minutes, my goal is to make you feel as uncomfortable as I can about your digital identity. Um, and then in the next, you know, in the last two minutes or so, to kind of bring it back and uh, give you some suggestions about how companies could make you feel a bit better about it. Okay, so what is digital identity? Um, people straight away think of Facebook and Twitter. So Facebook knows who your friends are, how often you talk to those people, um, what you say to them, <coughs> the things that you like, so your favorite films, your favorite celebrities, um, the words that you use, the, you know, the specific words, um, how many exclamation marks you use. Um, Twitter knows your, kind of your political opinions, the things that you want other people to know about. Um, so, but they're the obvious ones, and there'll be some people here kind of smugly sitting there going, I stopped using Facebook and Twitter because, you know, there were so many privacy issues. Um, you know, I don't want people to have my data. So let's kind of go beyond those and think about search engines. So search engine is part of your digital identity. So the things you search for say a lot about you as a person. Um, if you use Gmail or some other, you know, Yahoo <coughs> mail, then they know who you're talking to. <coughs> Um, they know the words that you're using, they know how often you uh, email your mum. <laughs> Amazon and other online retailers, so they, they know the things you actually buy. Um, and your cookies, which follow you around the internet. So most websites, every time you go to them, they'll set up a whole set of cookies on your computer so that when you go to a different website, they can say, okay, that's the same person who was on the previous website, and they kind of follow you around the web. Um, so, you know, you may be off Facebook and Twitter, but there's a whole set of other services you may be using instead. So there may be one person here who uh, doesn't use the internet at all, so they say, you know, I, I keep away from that horrible internet thing, you know, it's such a privacy nightmare. Um, but do they have a mobile phone? So your mobile phone knows who you talk to, it's got GPS, so it knows where you go. Um, again, it's got all your text messages. Um, your store card, you know, club card, uh, nectar card, that knows what you buy. And you've, when you signed up to that, you told them where you live and all that kind of information as well. Um, and even if you keep away from those, most people nowadays need a credit card. Um, so um, even if you don't have a club card, if you go into Tesco and you use the same credit card, they, uh, you know, they'll link up your purchases together with the credit card and they'll say, last week you bought this, you know, this week um, you should buy whatever. Okay. So and again, you may be thinking, OK, these are many different services, um, but they're kind of individual ones. But what's coming in the last uh, few years is that companies are starting to link these together. Um, so here's an example from Facebook. Um, they're partnering with a company called uh, Data Logics and uh, a few others. And they're linking up your Facebook data with your offline purchases. So these companies are going in the back and they're saying, OK, it's someone with this date of birth and this name. We can match them together with their Facebook profile. Um, some other things, MasterCard, MasterCard, Facebook. And this one is mobile phones selling your, um, you know, your mobile phone data and then linking that to other data sets as well. Um, so <coughs> I guess the first point I want to make is that you don't have kind of many digital identities. Um, or at least, you know, in the next couple of years you won't because they'll all be linked together into just one digital identity that you can't really get away from in the modern world. You know, you have to have these services. Um, so then what we did as researchers from, uh, from psychology, um, we said, okay, what, are these, what does this digital identity say about me as a person, say about you as a person? Um, so I set um, a, uh, a whole load of questionnaires online. Uh, this is a personality questionnaire. There was also an IQ questionnaire, happiness questionnaire, things like that. And we got people to fill in those questionnaires um, and then share with us their Facebook data. Um, and that meant we could then publish this study showing that once you've got someone's Facebook likes, so just their Facebook likes, avoiding all of the other information on Facebook, never mind the other information around the web, um, you can predict with someone's Facebook likes someone's personality, someone's intelligence, someone's happiness, someone's political views, someone's religious views, um, their use of language. So on the left, extrovert, talk about partying and baby and girls and amazing and nights out and things like that. And introverts talking about uh, anime and the internet and Pokemon <laughs> and, uh, and manga. Um, and some other things as well, age, gender, ethnic origin, sexual orientation, whether you're in a relationship or not whether your parents were in a relationship when you were growing up, um, the things you studied and uh, things about your 
friendship network. Um, so how accurate are we with those? So I can give you some stats, <coughs> which is that if we've got a male and a female and their likes, we can 93% uh, of the time say which is which accurately. Um, if we've got an African American, we've got a Caucasian American, 95% of the time we can say which is which. Um, perhaps a better way to put it is this, which is how well does the computer know you compared to the real people who know you? Okay, so on the x-axis is the number of likes we use to make a prediction about someone's personality. On the y-axis is uh, the accuracy of our prediction of their personality. So what you can see is you need about nine likes over there on the left um, before the algorithm is as accurate as a work colleague at predicting your personality. We need about 65 likes um, before we're as accurate as a cohabitant. Um, about 60, uh, yeah, 65 uh, as, as a friend. Um, the average human accuracy is about 0.49, so that's about 95 likes. Um, your family member is about 125 likes. Um, and then our computer expected accuracy, which is the average number of likes that people actually have, so that's about 20, 225. Um, so that is almost as accurate as your spouse at predicting your personality. So a computer knows you as well as your wife, near enough. <laughs> okay, um, so that's the kind of, that's the, the scary part. So then the question is, what can companies do to make us feel better about that, right? And I, I think the answer is sort of, well, you know, part of the answer is partly um, <coughs> in the reaction that we got to this study. So the reaction we got was quite split. So on the one hand, there were um, machine learners and people from Facebook and the people who do these kinds of predictions and, um, in the past. And they say, well, we've been doing this for 10 years. You know, this was obvious. Um, you know, we're surprised you even bothered to publish this. You know, we already knew this. And then the reaction from the more general population, um, which was, you know, crazy media coverage all over the place. Um, and what it suggests, I think, is that the people doing the machine learning, they think that, first of all, that we know kind of what they're doing already, and also they think that they're doing it for our good. Um, so just a little anecdote. So you may be thinking, you know, all of this is horrible. It can't possibly be good. So I got a text message a few months ago from my mobile phone company, and it said, um, I'm going to give you a voucher for Nando's in Nottingham. And I saw a voucher for Nando's, and I was very pleased about that. And then I saw Nottingham, and I thought, I haven't lived there for four years. If anyone knows where I live, it should be my mobile phone. Because <coughs> I've been in Cambridge for the last three years. You know, it's got GPS, it's got uh, all its towers. It should know I'm in Cambridge. And of course, I um, registered my mobile phone, you know, seven years ago in Nottingham. Um, so that's an example of kind of bad targeting. Um, so bad targeting is the kind of the spam that we don't want. We'd rather have, you know, one message per day, which is actually relevant to us, rather than a hundred messages, which are all rubbish. Um, so it can be used for good, but people don't really understand how it's used now. So it feels like these predictions happen to you, right? You're not sort of part of it. It's some computer programmer over here, and he's doing things with your data, and he's giving you predictions that you don't understand, you may not have you know, you may not have asked for, you may prefer that they weren't there. Um, so that's my first kind of suggestion to companies that I'd like to see more of. And it's, um, it's explaining kind of how they made these predictions to you. So if it was Facebook on the right hand side, it would not just show you adverts, it would say, we've shown you this advert because of X, because we think you're this kind of person. Um, so here's our example um, from our like study. So we've got a website, youarewhatyoulike.com. Um, if you're interested in what your likes say about you, you can go to this website, log in with Facebook, it pulls all of your likes and it makes a personality prediction about you. Um, so you can see whether our algorithm would say you are extroverted or a liberal or you know, whichever. Um, there are examples of companies who do this already. So if you think of Amazon, um, people don't sort of think that Amazon's recommendations are kind of an advert. But essentially they are. It's saying you bought this, so we suggest you buy that. But actually that's quite useful because if I bought this, I'm thinking, you know, what should I buy next? And Amazon is saying, well, you know, the other people who bought that bought this, so maybe this is good for you. Um, so you can see here, Amazon thinks I should get the latest XKCD book because I'm a nerd. And uh, <laughs> I've also been learning to cook uh, sweets. <laughs> so that's why that one's there on the right. Um, but what's interesting is you can see there's a little fix this recommendation 
button. And this is, I think, also important. So it's not just why have we made this recommendation, but let me help you, Amazon, whoever's making the prediction, to make it better. So if you do click on that, it says, we recommended this XKD's, XKCD book for you, and the reason is you bought this other book that happens to be by the same author. Okay, and then I can say, I already own this book, so stop trying to get me to buy it, or um, don't use this other book that you're using to make recommendations, perhaps because I just bought it for a friend, so it's not for me anyway, so it's not relevant for me. Okay, so that's one side of it. The other side is, once, you, once companies explain to us why they're trying to push certain things into us and what predictions they're making about us, that allows us to have an informed decision to say, you know, do I like it? And, um, you know, and then, and then what am I going to do? And currently, the only what am I going to do is stop using Facebook or stop using Twitter or stop using whatever. But as I tried to allude to at the beginning, I don't think that's a reasonable option because I don't think you can, um, you can kind of opt out of all these digital services. You know, you just, it's, it's so difficult to get through life with a credit card. And that shouldn't be the only choice we have. It shouldn't be, you know, use it or lose it. it there should be some kind of middle ground. And I think the potential middle ground should be, let me pay you to keep my data safe because I just want that service. I don't want you selling my data around that service. I just want to use <coughs> Facebook. I just want to use Twitter without you selling my data. And of course, you have to make money to run Facebook, to run Twitter. So I'm going to pay you some money to do that. Um, so, you know, maybe the first, um, the first sort of worry you have is, you know, no one's going to pay. Um, but there are examples of this actually happening in, in real life. And club cars and these store cars are one example. And essentially, what Tesco is saying to you, you think you're getting a discount, but actually they're saying, if you don't use Club Card, it's going to cost you 1% more. Right? So if you share your data with us, you can pay the real price. But if you don't share your data, it's going to cost more. Right? So you are paying more to not share your data with, Club, with Tesco if you pay by cash. Right? So that's kind of the choice you're making. And then Boots Advantage Card, they give you more. Um, interestingly, Nest Nectar Card, they've recently um, announced that their uh, points are going to be worth half, half as much as they were before. And partly I think that's because the contract has kind of changed because they can track you through your credit card instead of you having to have a store card. But I think the store card in general, it's a kind of a, it puts an amount of money on how much privacy is worth. And, uh, you know, about 68% of people have a club card, so some people think it's worth it. Um, so would that be worth it for Facebook? Um, so here's Facebook's revenue. Um, well, so <coughs> Facebook in the last quarter, they made about $3 billion, which sounds like an insane amount of money until you go, well, how many people are using Facebook, right? And what this is a graph of is um, the ad revenue per user on Facebook per quarter in dollars. Um, so in the last quarter, which was Facebook's most successful, um, they made $2.61 per person, okay? So what I suggest is that uh, companies either, you know, they should do it voluntarily or, um, you know, it should be mandated that there should be an option to say, you know what, you make $2.61, I will pay you $2.61 for a quarter, you know, for three months, so less than 60p per month, in order that I can use Facebook without you selling my data to everyone else, without you showing me all these adverts. And it's, it's amazing for you because not only do you get a whole set of people who may have just opted out of Facebook altogether. Um, you also don't have to sell all these pesky adverts because that's effort for you as well. Um, and it's such a sort of, you know, for me, I think that would be something I would be willing to pay. If you're interested about other companies, so Twitter would work out about half as much. So it would be about 30 pence per month. That's how much Twitter makes from you. So would you be willing to pay Twitter 30 pence just to, um, you know, to stop them selling your data to everyone else? Um, Google makes about six times as much as Facebook per user. So Google, it will be about, um, what, so about $12 per uh, every three months. So uh, what is that? So it's about three pounds per month. So you may decide that you know, Google's too expensive. I'll just use Google for free, and they can have my data. But um, Facebook, I'm willing to pay that money. OK, so uh, my kind of conclusion is that um, we've all got one digital identity. <coughs> and it encompasses a whole range of services. We can't do without those services, and you know, we shouldn't have to do without those services. So I suggest companies should explain to us how they're using their data, 
I mean, it's very simple. They go, we've taken this like, and it's made this <coughs> prediction. So it's very simple. Um, and then uh, we should have the option, once we understand what they're doing with the data, we should have the option to say, you know, here's a, a paltry sum of money uh, for you to stop me, uh, for you to stop selling that data. All right, thanks very much. So much.